Okay, hello. And I wanted to welcome you all to our webinar today on our part of our career success series on criminal justice careers and, and pathways and skills necessary for success in those fields. Without further ado, let's quickly get started. Like I mentioned, I'm um, with CSU Global. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Marketing. And my name is Andy Dixon. And today we also have Dr. Michael Skiba. He's our Program Chair of Criminal Justice. who will be providing the um, majority of our presentation today. But to start off, I just wanted to quickly tell you a little bit about CSU Global. I know some people attending today are current students and alumni and staff and faculty, but for those of you who are not aware, CSU Global is the first 100% online public state university. We were created in 2007 by the CSU system here in Colorado, and we're exclusively designed for helping working adults and non-traditional learners advance their career through education. Um, it's really about making sure that you have the skills and are able to get a return on your investment for what specifically you're looking for within the industry today. Um, without further ado then, let me quickly introduce Dr. Michael Skiba. He's our program chair of criminal justice. He has over 22 years of experience in the private sector and in academia for the past 15 years. And we're fortunate enough to have him here overseeing all of our criminal justice programs from emergency management, homeland security, and our bachelor's and master's degree in criminal justice themselves. So, Dr. Skiba, take it away. Great, thank you, Andy. Uh, appreciate it, and I appreciate all the attendees as well. Um, you, you know, I'm hoping that we uh, can explore areas in criminal justice. Um, it is an area that I have operated in uh, prior to becoming program chair for for over 22 years. Uh, I had one of the most exciting careers uh, um, imaginable, um, and, and I, I kind of took a non-traditional path, if you will, and that's what I wanted to explain to you today, uh, just kind of give you a, a kind of an inside uh, look uh, at, at some, some career options, uh, look at the criminal justice kind of industry as a whole, and discuss some pathways, uh, maybe, maybe ones that you haven't thought about before. Um, but as, as Andy mentioned, too, please use the chat. We're here for you, so if there's something that um, you know, you want to hear uh, or talk about or ask, please, please don't hesitate to do that because we're here for you. So uh, first off, criminal justice industry outlook. Um, you know, it is, again, such an exciting area and it's one that really has longevity. Um, you know, as, as seen here, just a few statistics from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, there's job growth pretty much in every area. And these are just, you know, four examples of that. Um, I guarantee if you were to, to look at industry outlook in any area outside of here, you would definitely see growth, whether it's in uh, corrections, whether it's in uh, courts, public, private sector. Um, this is an area that, that will never, ever um, become stale. You know, we're always going to have people trying to take advantage of systems and um, uh, situations. And, and accordingly, um, it's going to make a very, very secure uh, environment. So we, he's, we, what we see here, of course, uh, police officers, 10% growth, investigators and other professionals in fraud, anywhere from 10, uh, 8% to 17, uh, cyber jobs, anything with cyber on them, uh, you know, is, is considered to grow upwards of, of 28% uh, or more. So uh, definitely an area uh, worth, worth looking into. I go next slide, Andy. So here's, here's just kind of a, a further foundation, some, some career opportunities and, and different uh, salary data. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's another thing, too, is that our, our industry really pays well, you know, even at the entry level. Um, and pretty much every area that you get into, you know, we talk about base pay, as you see here, but, but I really don't know of any position that doesn't also have uh, additional pay um, beyond uh, the base salary, you know, whether it's, it's overtime, whether it's working in different areas, uh, whether it's project-based pay, um, you know, most, uh, most occupations uh, uh, in, in the criminal justice field uh, will start here, but, um, you know, I would say, I would argue that almost all of them, um, you know, re uh, will, will, will reward uh, professionals with, with additional pay in different areas. So, uh, it's, it's a fantastic area, you know, coupled with the statistics we saw um, to, uh, um, you know, to really have a fantastic uh, career, not a job, a career. So what, what we've done here, the next couple slides, is, is really put together, you know, faculty and myself. So we have 
about 50 faculty members, um, all hardcore practitioners. And what we, what we did here with the Pathways is just discuss, um, you know, okay, you know, like when I first started, I, I thought I wanted to get into a certain area. And I ended up probably taking about uh, five or six pivot points through my career, um, kind of finding my way through, as you see here, these columns. So what we did was we sat down and kind of, um, you know, designed these pathways. And this is just an example, two slides of, of basic examples of pathways you can take. And there are a ton of them. There's a lot of them. Um, so, for example, and, and, and it's important to know, too, what we're going to be talking about today um, you know, our, our career paths that can be taken anywhere uh, in your journey, whether it's, you know, first year student right out of high school, all the way into uh, maybe looking to transition in a new position, or uh, second careers. You know, many, many jobs are structured uh, accordingly. You know, we have a lot of police officers, uh, military that that do, uh, you know, their, their, you know, 20 years or 15 or whatever is required, and then they look for that second career. Um, so, so what we've done here is kind of develop some pathways to say, okay, these are the steps uh, that we foresee uh, getting into these fields. So we see here we have three law enforcement careers. So if you're looking at uh, getting, if you're looking at strictly staying into law enforcement, um, you know, kind of a, a nice little pathway or, or fraud management, emergency management and forensics. So if you want to specialize in one of those areas and you currently are an officer in the military, how do you get there? And, and this kind of showcases certain steps and degrees and certifications uh, to make you very, very marketable in a competitive environment. Next slide, we see just some other examples. Um, so here, you know, again, are just a few, you know, forensics, uh, emergency management, private sector investigations, uh, and private sector security. Again, um, you know, how do I get there? Well, uh, here's some steps, some, you know, some, some pathways. And again, uh, these, this is not all encompassing. These are just examples of, of you know, the, the end result and what you would need to get to that point, um, you know, as you go through the, uh, go through the process. Uh, but, but all of these areas, you know, you can, you can pivot at any point in time. You know, I, I started off actually in the financial sector, so I wasn't even included in this pathway. Um, and I ended up in the fraud management pathway. Um, you know, I, I, I got a master's degree, which, which opened up some doors for me and then a certification. Uh, and then I continued on from there. And I think that's what's so important is to, um, you know, keep looking for those pivot points uh, and, and, you know, what you can do to make yourself, um, you know, again, more marketable in those specific areas. And next slide, maybe. And, and just to follow up on that a little bit, and I'll take it for just a moment to talk a little bit about how that aligns with CSU Global. But, um, you know, as we kind of created those career ladders between Dr. Skiba and, and uh, his wonderful faculty and stuff, we started looking at that it really is a lifelong of career opportunities within the industry. So um, at CSU Global, we've aligned a lot of those with um, our certificates and our specializations for you to be able to have the educational requirements that match that. So, you know, it's important, I believe, to, to think about the individual skills and the short term steps along the way to get you towards really career success, not job success, as Dr. Skeeton mentioned. Um, stackable credentials is one of those that I want to go into a little bit more detail when you're designing your personalized learning path. Uh, if I can get it to the next slide here. Um, so when you're considering what your career job is, you should be, you know, utilizing our career center and our career coaches. And there is a number of options for you to kind of help devise the educational pathways that help you. So if you're looking for something in cyber threat and emergency management, you know, to be able to start with a cybersecurity certificate and then roll into a bachelor's degree in criminal justice, but still earn specializations and certificates of completions along the way in emergency management or homeland security or uh, criminal forensics, as we see on another path here. The ability for you to tailor your, your learning um, at different stages of what your specific skill needs are I think is just an important fact that we wanted to make sure and put a throw a couple slides in here to uh, uh, really impress upon you as we go. And that is very individual. I want to mention that as well, that this is kind of up to you to determine what your career goals are. We're happy to support you and kind of build that pathway with you, but there is no prescribed way. There is no right way. Like Dr. Skiba said, where he started is very different than where he ended. So to make sure that you have um, those opportunities to find the right path for you to be as successful as possible is what we're trying to accomplish here. So thank you for the interlude to talk a little bit about us and the opportunities for you. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Skiba to talk about some of the hot trends and um, opportunities and, and pathways in particular industries, right? 
Fantastic. So um, this is the part that I love. So um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend, uh, you know, just a few minutes talking about some specific hot areas in criminal justice right now. Um, and and I, could, I could talk, quite frankly, probably for uh, two hours on each, uh, because I, I'm, I'm very passionate about this field, about this industry, um, you know, because you can really, really make a difference. And I think, you know, I, I have worked in other areas and other industries, um, you know, from business uh, into the financial sector and, and all different areas. And, and I have to tell you that, that in criminal justice, there's, there's an underlying sense of that the need and desire to help people, to help the public, whether it's domestic, international, no matter what role you have. And that brings a, a special kind of person uh, into, into this field, a community, if you will. And it's like no other that I've operated in. So, so you can tell I'm very passionate about this. And, and, and like I said, I'm gonna just spend a few minutes talking about each, but please, uh, if any of these uh, you know, appeal to you, um, you know, talk, you know, ask questions in the chat, more than happy to expand on them, and even, even you know, talk offline as well. Um, so, so firstly, you know, private security government contracting. So I think you know, the first thing that comes to mind when you think of that is you think of um, you know, maybe, maybe friends or colleagues that um, you know, were offered a position uh, you know, to go overseas, uh, let's say, in, in maybe undesirable areas uh, as a contractor for a year um, in maybe a security position or, or something like that. I will tell you that those jobs do exist. They're, they're um, you know, uh, uh, very worthy of exploration for sure. But there are thousands and thousands of jobs outside of that in private security and contracting. I've done both of those. Uh, worked for both government and private security. Uh, for years, I was a trainer for the US Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. So that was a government contract I had with them and it was so exciting. I got to go on their military bases um, but I was a contractor, you know, and it was, it was something I did on a temporary basis. Um, so these aren't the kind of things where, you know, you have to make full-time commitments to. I worked on a consultation basis uh, with them. So, you know, what usually they look for uh, in these areas are, are, you know, background and a skill in a specific area. So, for example, for me, they were looking for me to train their agents on how to investigate white-collar crime, which was right in my wheelhouse. That's what I did for 22 years. Um, so, so developing a skill set in an area, um, you know, and then training uh, on that, that was a specific niche that I had. But I would say there are, if you even just look on like usajobs.gov, for example, um, there are so many uh, positions there. But even outside of that, you know, if you go into each department's uh, website, whether it's Department of Energy or, or it, it could be anything, it could be, it could be the CDC uh, per se. They're always looking for people in our industry with specific skills. It could even be finance. It doesn't have to be hardcore investigations. Um, so it could be anything along um, those lines. Corrections even. Um, you know, uh, they are very big uh, on, on um, you know, hiring individuals that have a, a very, um, you know, a strong background in, in security. So, so the, the point being is that, that you know, they're very, there's a lot of positions available outside of, of maybe what, what you know, uh, what the general public thinks, if you will. Um, so career story there, as I mentioned, um, you know, the ATF, I've done a lot of training with them. Um, I also know people um, that, that work for governments overseas, you know, so they'll, they'll actually transition um, even more on a full-time basis, um, but temporary, you know, so maybe they'll do six months. Uh, I had a colleague that actually worked um, in, uh, in Belgium for a while, for six months for the government, and he was just kind of a liaison, fantastic position, um, six months, and then he came home. Um, uh, but it was a, you know, a, a white collar, non-threat type position. Um, so, um, you know, th th these, are, these are situations and, and things that are available, um, you know, to people in our industry that have those, you know, specific uh, skill sets. Next slide, Andy. Okay, so white collar crime. Uh, so let's talk for two hours. Uh, no, this, so again, this I am a perfect example sitting here in front of you um, that made a, a very, very exciting career out of, out of white collar crime and fraud. Um, and I think there's, there's um, you know, kind of a uh, misconception, uh, if you will, about the pathway to get here. Um, and again, I was very, very non-traditional, if you will. I had, had a business background. My, my undergrad degree, well, my, my grad degree uh, is in, my undergrad degree is in criminal justice. Uh, my grad, de grad degree is in business. Um, so I think 
in, in this area, what, what's looked for is, is maybe more of a focus on the ability and a knowledge base of businesses. Um, that definitely, definitely helped me uh, because when it came time to actually investigate uh, businesses, uh, investigate people running those businesses, um, I, had a, I had enough information to be dangerous, if you will, you know, to ask for certain financial records. I mean, uh, I'm not a CPA, I'm not an accountant, but I knew enough to kind of get, uh, you know, request the right things and, and look in the right areas. Um, but that being said, uh, someone with an accounting background, um, forensic accountants, forensic accountants um, are individuals I work with on, you know, I work with on a daily basis. So any, any area that, that you can, or any, any time you can get exposure uh, to those, those um, you know, business elements will absolutely help you, uh, help you here. Because what you're doing really is you're coupling the investigative component with the business component. Um, and, and really, this is an exciting area because um, you know, studies show that these types of criminals are more cognitive than others. So uh, it's, it's, it's like a chess match, if you will. You know, it's kind of like uh, in a lot of the investigations I did, I would say more than three quarters, the, the subject, quote unquote, knew I was investigating them. And it, it became very challenging and exciting uh, knowing that, knowing that they knew. So not only did I have to figure out how to investigate them, I had to figure out how to do it so they didn't know. Or, or to stay two or three moves ahead of them. So um, I, think, I think this field is incredibly challenging. This is gonna grow uh, by, by leaps and bounds in, in the upcoming years, simply because uh, businesses are seen um, as, as having a lot of money, right? Uh, it's as simple as that. So the criminal element is drawn to a significant degree to this area. Um, I was involved in, in quite a few organized crime investigation and even with those that had international ties uh, to, uh, uh, to terrorism. And, and, and I remember uh, sitting across from um, a, uh, you know, a, a convicted uh, serial fraudster um, and he said to me, it was easy. You know, he said, you know, compared to kidnapping and extortion and all these other dangerous crimes, they, you know, he said white collar crime was completely, completely easy. Um, you know, they actually used it as part of their cash flow. So um, any way you can help businesses here, um, plug those gaps, uh, find those vulnerabilities uh, is really, really going to help you. Um, and again, you know, having a specific skill set in that, you know, with a business background, whether it's the finance piece, it could also be the management piece, uh, could be the investigations uh, aspect of it. Um, there's a lot of different ways and different areas to get into here um, that, uh, um, that are, again, very, very exciting. And again, I made a, a wonderful international career for over 20 years in this area, and I, I work with some of the best people, um, you know, uh, uh, in the world here. So definitely an area to look into for sure. So risk management, emergency management, um, here's an area that, that is, is incredibly, incredibly hot right now. Um, and, and I'll tell you why, because this encompasses a lot of different things. A lot, a lot of times I see risk management um, in a whole different bucket, almost like in the auditing departments of companies. Um, so it's, it's kind of used in different areas, but at the end of the day, what it is, it's, it's finding vulnerability. So it's kind of, like I mentioned with white collar crime, um, but what risk managers and emergency managers do is, is they look for those vulnerabilities, right? They look for areas that a um, opportunistic uh, or a contrived criminal could take advantage of a system, right? And that's, it's really fun. So what, you, what, what, what these individuals do is they will look through the whole ecosystem of a company, uh, of a process, um, it could be, you know, external relationships, could be internal, um, and they're looking to assess those risks. Um, and then, you know, do that vulnerability assessment, perform it, uh, and then deliver that uh, to, to management, to, to project managers, um, and then kind of help, you know, plug those holes, if you will. Now, what's interesting here, though, is risk managers overlap with emergency managers, because emergency managers, many of you think, um, uh, or the first person thought that comes to mind is, is FEMA. Um, and, and they are heavily involved, of course, in, in, in domestic emergency management. Um, 
but there's a lot of overlap in different private sector uh, areas. Um, so, so for example, banks, banks require, you know, an emergency manager, a risk manager um, at all different levels. I mean, even, even local, uh, you know, small banks um, have someone, you know, designated in their bank in their small little jurisdiction. It could only be maybe 20 employees. That's a risk emergency manager. And their job basically is not only to look at the, the financial uh, books and, and look for vulnerabilities, but also, um, you know, what happens if a tornado comes through, a hurricane? What happens if an active shooter comes in? I mean, that's the kind of thing a risk manager uh, is responsible for, all those natural disasters, the business interruption, and what happens to their clientele if they can't get access to, to things online. I mean, these are all things that emergency managers, um, 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 you know, are in control over. And a lot of state agencies do training uh, in this area. So, so there's many opportunities, uh, both public uh, and private sector. Um, background and skills needed, I would say, vast. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, having a degree in emergency management um, and being aligned with, uh, with FEMA and some of these industry groups will absolutely, absolutely help with exposure. Um, and private sector as well. You know, um, again, I've worked through the years with, with many risk managers uh, in, again, in financial institutions, um, in retail locations. Um, almost, I would say you could pick any industry, um, any job, um, and they will have a risk or emergency manager uh, that works within those facilities. Even schools too, um, you know, again, the, the active shooter scenarios, that falls under the bucket of the risk or emergency manager. Um, and all, and, you know, that point of contact in the school has to be trained. They have to go through that awareness. Um, so there's a lot of different pathways uh, to take there. Um, but, but, you know, the, the, the familiarity with nat, both natural um, and, um, you know, normal disasters uh, would be uh, within, their, uh, within their scope. And Homeland Security, of course, um, you know, and, and there is an overlap here uh, with, with emergency managers as well. Um, so Homeland Security, of course, uh, we think of, of DHS, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, they're the first that, that, uh, that comes to mind. Uh, but Homeland Security really involves so many different things. Um, you know, I think, uh, um, you know, there, there's a lot of different areas within Homeland Security, such as investigations, security investigations. Um, they, they, they cover all kinds of threats, domestic, right? Even natural disasters. Um, and I tell you, even even the overlap um, in the in the private sector. So, um, with all the the you know man-made, uh, or excuse me, with all the natural disasters that occur uh, throughout a year, whether it's um, you know from the Northeast, so we have uh, snowstorms and ice uh, to to Florida, where they have the uh, um, you know hurricanes, tornadoes, things like that, to to West with fires. Um, these these cause an incredible, incredible impact um, on people uh, from a humanitarian level, um, but also second to that um, from a financial, a financial level. So, you know, if you follow uh, the insurance industry, you know, the property casualty industry, that is those that insure homes, um, they suffer incredible, incredible losses. So, so, so those um, companies designate people to, to handle uh, these these catastrophes, and they actually have what they call catastrophe teams. I worked on one for for many years, very early on in my career, uh, and my job basically was to be deployed. So I worked, you know, I worked for a insurance company. But when a disaster would come in, I would go to that disaster. I would help with the response, uh, both you know, again, humanitarian uh, and uh, and financial, um, because if you can imagine, the impact is huge. Uh, all the way around. So, so again, there's many, many opportunities. And another example too is uh, in in the wildfires recently. Um, some of the the um, insurance companies that insured some of those upper end homes, like in Malibu and on the West Coast, um, they actually hired full fledged fire departments to go to those scenes and try to preserve those homes ahead of the fire. Um, you know, as opposed to paying out millions of dollars on the home, they figured, well, okay, you know, it's 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 better to to actually Pay to try to prevent that. So, so these are things that, that again, are, are kind of non-traditional. Maybe you, you might not find, um, you know, in, in normal criminal justice, um, you know, conversations, but, but these occupations, uh, these jobs uh, do exist, and they're, they're quite exciting careers 
Um, but again, you know, th those, those are available both in the private sector uh, and the public sector. Um, and as far as, uh, you know, background and skills needed, um, this, this could be, again, uh, military, law enforcement, um, you know, any type of, of security background, um, any type of protection or threat protection um, uh, definitely will help you, help you in this area for sure. And lastly, cybercrime. Um, so, so this is a, a really, really hot area. Um, and I think, you know, in my opinion, uh, what, what I see from myself, my faculty, and, and based in, on, on my experiences, um, you know, in, in the years to come, I do not think, I do not think that any of our occupations uh, are at risk. Um, but the way that they are, um, how should I say, the way that they operate is going to change. So what I see is the word cyber being put in front of everything we do in criminal justice, right? So uh, police officers, um, you know, we're going to have cyber police. You know, we're going to have more maybe robots doing certain things. I mean, we see this now, right? We see with, with, with bombs where the days of having a, you know, a bomb tech uh, go up to a uh, potential IED, um, you know, are, are gone. Now we have robots do that um, to, to, you know, help preserve lives. So, um, but you still need someone that knows there's always going to be a human component because still, you still need someone to look at the video that the robot's taking. The robot's not going to be able to make a decision on which wire to cut, right? Um, so there's always going to be a human component to that. Um, but, but cyber, I would argue you can put between, you know, in front of any, in front or behind any job title that we have right now uh, in criminal justice. And this is where the trajectory is going to be uh, in a few years. But you still, you still need those foundational items, right? Because it's still going to come down to, um, you know, in, in criminal justice, it's, it's about face-to-face -face interaction, no matter where you are, right? Courts, corrections, investigations, uh, policing, uh, there is always a human component to that, right? Um, so that's why we always focus on those foundational elements of criminal justice, of, of crime causation and um, the history of crime and corrections and punishment, because it's important to still have those theoretical things. Um, robots, machines, cyber, um, you know, we're not going to be able to insert that uh, in, in, in their, you know, knowledge base. So we still need people to make those decisions. But this is an area that's so, so exciting. Um, there's so many pathways to go here. And, and I will say this, that, um, you know, a lot of times people, people think of cybercrime as having you know, you need very, very heavy IT and coding skills. Um, that, is, that is not true at all. Cybercrime is, is encompassing of so many different things. Um, even, even a matter of evidence, you know, um, frontline police officers should have basic, a basic understanding of, you know, what to look for uh, in a cell phone. Um, you know, uh, what, what's, you know what's, what's in someone's computer and how does that fit into an investigation? Um, so, so any time I would say, um, um, you know, you can leverage any type of, of skill set um, in the cyber area will absolutely help you. There's so many different pathways uh, to go uh, here, you know, whether you, um, you know, you focus on, on cy cyber crime from an IT level, cyber crime to an investigative level. Um, I mean, there's, there's just a lot of different, um, you know, a lot of different areas to get into. Um, you know, and I also think that, that, you know, getting involved, let's, let's say in, um, you know, fraud management, um, you know, fraud management specialization or an accounting specialization or um, even leadership uh, coupled with some IT uh, will make you extremely dangerous uh, in this area. Uh, but this, this is, again, another hot, hot area that, that I really foresee growing uh, in, the, uh, in the upcoming years. So that's kind of, again, I could stay on the line uh, for forever. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm so happy to, to expand on any of these different areas. Um, I'm so excited to be a part of, of, of uh, such an exciting program. Uh, there wasn't a day I had that wasn't, uh, you know, exciting and different than the day before. Um, and, and all these areas I know are going to continue to grow, you know, as we have those threats, those constant threats that are going to come into us. So... Thank you very much, Dr. Skiba. I think that uh, was very insightful and uh, kind of shows all the different opportunities that maybe are not often considered in those different areas. So thank you so much for all those fantastic um, insights about the uh, field in general. 
Um, I do have some questions coming in. I wanted to remind everyone how to submit those. So you can either do it through the chat or you can do it um, through the Q&A feature within the Zoom webinar. Just uh, feel free to submit, submit your questions either way there. Um, I've received a number through the Q&A here. Let me find a good one to start with for you. Um, so, so we kind of started talking about kind of those career paths for law enforcement officers. Can you expand a little bit on the value of a degree for law enforcement officers? And are all departments the same in terms of what they need in order to get promoted within those departments? Yeah, super question. Um, and I would say every department seems to be different. They, you know, they would have different requirements. Of course, if you're at a municipal level, sheriff level, state level, or, or federal level. Um, but what I would argue is, you know, when I, when I started back 20 years ago, I would say, um, you know, uh, a degree, uh, a degree was, was optional. Um, and even, even, you know, a two year degree, uh, was, was, you know, seen as, okay, that's, that's a great stepping stone. I will say now, um, just again, due to the, the competitive nature, uh, of, you know, of the industry, um, I would argue definitely, definitely a degree would be something that, um, you know, uh, would, would absolutely, uh, behoove, you know, someone trying to, to get in that field or even, even advance. Um, and, you know, I do know that a lot of times the, the advancement requirements uh, within departments, uh, a lot of times they will require, let's say you're going from, uh, you know, or, or want to get into detective work or sergeant or advancement, um, they actually require as part of uh, the, the admissions process to show that you're pursuing a degree of some sort, not necessarily even in criminal justice. It could be in uh, a specialty like a forensics or accounting or something like that, you know, to add value to the department. Uh, but I do know a lot of agencies um, focus on that. And um, I mean, uh, you know, with, with the, the criminal justice programs, um, you know, uh, one, one of the things, too, that I kind of mentioned in the beginning about, about the community, um, I can't tell you just being involved. I mean, I still to this day, still to this day, back 1992, still talk to some of the people I first took criminal justice courses with, because that's just the kind of community that we are. And, and I know all of you are going to find this to be the case. Um, and, and I crossed paths with, with several people. I now work again, um, for example, a, a gentleman that I hadn't seen in maybe 15 years. I ran into him two weeks ago up in Burlington, Vermont. He's now regional, um, uh, regional special agent for the ATF. Uh, and he and I started, you know, intro class back locally. Um, and we, we touched base on his exciting career and mine. And uh, now we're starting to, to work together again. So, I mean, um, just, just that that end of it is something that that we kind of didn't touch on, but but you know, very very important from from an educational level is that networking, those connections um, that you're going to make and be able to leverage, um, you know, outside of just the the strict um, you know credits. Okay. Next question here is related to government contracting. Are all of those jobs overseas in high threat areas, or are there other opportunities? Yeah, and, and again, that's that's the first thing I think, um, uh, you know, the, kind of the, the public sees is because we all know, you know, back when the threats were uh, were happening more in, in, in the Middle East back maybe 10 years ago, a lot of opportunities came up for government contracting where, um, uh, you know, uh, companies like Blackhawk, I mean, that's probably the first one that comes to mind, um, where, where they offer, um, you know, a year package, uh, a lot of tax-free money, and, and basically they're you know, you're, you're um, you know, doing a security detail frontline in, in the worst areas. Uh, and again, those jobs do exist for sure, but, but that is a very, very small percentage. Um, there are government contracting jobs, uh, probably local to most people that are, that are on this call. Um, you know, when I say government contracting, I mean, I don't mean, I mean, I mean federal government, but also state and local as well. There's a lot of opportunities, especially now, um, you know, uh, um, you know, with, with flexibility, um, you know, cause, cause I think there, there's also an understanding that a lot of, a lot of us in the criminal justice field, they, you know, we might have, um, you know, we might be working uh, full time for a police agency, uh, but maybe to, to add value to that agency, you know, to do some contracting work. A lot of times that's allowed, um, you know, depending on, on the situation, but, but the short answer to that is, is no, there's a lot of different opportunities, um, um, you know, again, usajobs.gov is just one example, but but I found mainly if you target the specific websites of those agencies, um, you know, you can um, you know you can kind of see how they're structured and and what's available. 
That actually is a great segue into my next question because I know you mentioned U.S. jobs earlier as a as an option. So the question is, what are some additional criminal justice resources to find jobs? Are there industry specific ones? I guess what we're getting there. Yeah, actually, there's there's, there's quite a few, um, and and I think um, you know the internet now has just opened up a ton of opportunities uh, uh, for for students. You know, and 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 really, um, what I have found is. Uh, yes, there are the big uh, uh, monsters out there, you know, for searching, um, and those are great. But what I would what I would um, argue is is a more specific approach. You know, for example, if if a student wants to get into uh, policing, let's say, uh, policeone.com is great because it's not a recruiting site. It's really just a location for officers to go. I mean, they even sell tactical gear and things on there. So. Um, it's really more of a community of police officers, but then within that, there's a link to career opportunities. So um, I find that when, when you find locations like that that don't have that um, you know, uh, recruitment goal uh, up front, uh, if you will, um, I'm trying to think, for example, like in, in fraud, um, the, the uh, um, International Association of Special Investigations Unit, which we uh, have a, a partnership, um, our members, our students are actually allowed to get on their website um, on the members only section and see those job postings of some of those jobs I mentioned, with fraud management and, uh, you know, private sector, public sector. Um, so I think, I think a more, more focused approach definitely helps. But those, those bigger um, sites, again, USA Jobs, at least it will give um, a student or prospect an area, um, you know, to look into just to give some idea of requirements per se, um, or, or, you know, specific career paths or, or whatnot. Great. Question coming in about additional information on certificates that might be needed to specific fields. So if, uh, this uh, viewer has an undergraduate in business, working on a master's in criminal justice, but wants to become a CI. Are there additional professional certifications or additional pieces that um, he or she can help ad advance their career? In? Yeah, and I, I think certifications are, are a fantastic uh, alternative. Uh, coupled with, um, you know, a specialization like that. So that's actually a, a, a really nice career path. Um, so, uh, you know, a master's in law enforcement is going to, um, you know, provide those advanced um, foundational elements that we get into where we start to talk a little bit about research even, which is very, very important. You know, being able to look at policies and, and help with um, implementation and making recommendations on policies. Um, so, so, you know, um, more of those leadership um, uh, roles that, that that's what that program is designed for coupled with a certification uh, is, is a very uh, I'll say deadly combination because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be focusing on a specific area uh, so, so so you know in investigation let's say fraud management let's say you decide to, to focus on a certification in fraud management um, that's going to give you um, you know those those specific core skills in that area because certifications are, are just that they're very focused you know just just due to the time uh time involved uh that it takes to uh, uh to obtain a certification so um you're going to get right to the point uh in those areas so pretty much and that's a that's a bigger trend i would say in the last uh maybe two two to three years uh in criminal justice is those certifications and you can get them pretty much in any field any industry they, they absolutely look fantastic uh, to uh, to pursue. That's great. Um, are there any public sites? Obviously, with uh, when the, our career center and career coaching, we have options to learn more about those specific certifications. Are there any public ones that you could recommend? I know I'm putting you on the spot there. It's kind of a follow up to that, but in, in uh, any, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like for, so, for example, I mentioned the fraud management. So um, you know, there are certifications. I mean, obviously, we you know we do offer uh, some certifications as well. But in the field, let's say there's a uh, CIFI, a Certified Insurance Fraud Investigator. Um, there's also, you know, I'm, I'm sure, uh, and, and that's um, delivered through the International Association of SIUs, who, who you know, um, we've developed a partnership with. Um, the um, Coalition Against Insurance Fraud, uh, they're also aligned uh, with them. Um, you know, FEMA, uh, the International Association of Emergency Man Managers, has a certification. Um, and again, um, you know, creating partnerships there, which, which we have will segue um, in, into that area as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, what is the difference between a public center and a private sector job? 
Yeah, that. you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I, I get that question a lot. And I think, um, you know, so public sector usually, uh, and, and these are two very, very, very big buckets. Um, but what I found in our industry is that, that that's kind of a commonality, a common term, two common terms that are used. Um, public sector traditionally um, is, is you know, the most traditional form would be a sworn in officer. Okay. Uh, private sector would be a investigator for an insurance company. Okay. Because they have two entirely different scopes, even though their job is to investigate and look for criminals. Um, uh, th there's a different approach. So the public sector position, uh, what they're looking for, of course, is to arrest the individual, you know, because they're protecting, uh, protecting laws of the community and laws of, of the government, uh, where the private sector uh, doesn't per se have that as their primary goal. Um, you know, a, a insurance investigator really a, as their goal is to, uh, you know, to manage risk with the company, you know, so they want to you know, of course, yes, they do want to see someone arrested for, for a white collar crime, but really what they're looking to do is, you know, um, um, avoid, uh, um, you know, a negative profit situation. You know, so if someone's uh, bilking them of millions of dollars, I mean, this is going to, uh, in effect, um, you know, affect their books, uh, bring them in the red. So, so these are two different areas to look at, but it's really the motivation of the individual. But yeah, there's a very, very stark difference between public uh, and private sector. I kind of operated in both, mainly in public sector, uh, but I was, um, you know, I did do some, again, contracting work in the public sector, like, again, USATF uh, and some other agencies. So there is, is an overlap uh, for sure, um, but, but different, uh, again, different approaches. But, uh, yeah, really, really great question. I believe I have one more. So if you do have any other questions, please go ahead and submit those. Otherwise, we'll be able to get off a little bit early. Um, but uh, perhaps a little bit early, I should say, because the last question is a little lofty. So I'm, I'm going to throw it at you and see what you think. With all of the technology emerging on a daily basis, um, how will that affect the many jobs that rely heavily on that face-to-face -face communication that you mentioned earlier? Police officers, the courts. What, what does technology do for that in addition to the job opportunities with cyber in front of it? How does it change the, the working environment there? Yeah, um, that, that's a really, really great question. And, and I think, um, you know, as I mentioned, it's so important. Um, I, I, think, I think that cyber, the word cyber, is going to be in front of almost everything we do. You know, I've, I've seen some statistics talking about uh, job outlooks and robotics and machine learning and AI and all these things. And I, I think, um, you know, so, some of the, um, the results from those uh, studies that I've done um, state that about 50% of the jobs within 10 years are going to have to pivot um, and will pivot um, based on, um, you know, based on all of this cyber stuff. But there is no doubt in my mind, no doubt um, that we still have to have that human component to that. Um, you know, I was uh, having lunch with a, a colleague of mine uh, last weekend um, and he works, he, he was military. Uh, he was, you know, uh, intelligence, data analytics. I mean, guy, um, fantastic, fantastic career. So his life was in numbers, um, but at the end of the day, what his job was to translate. You know, you still need someone to look at those numbers and say, "Yeah, you know what? This means this. This means something." You know, well, this person's trying to get away with this, but this is what we need to do to get around that. So you, you, I definitely do not think the human element will will kind of um, become withdrawn from any of our occupations. Um, I think they're just going to change a little bit, you know, and, and not to the point that we're all going to be sitting at desks coding and doing computer work, um, but, but just an awareness of whatever interest area you have, uh, again, whether it's investigations, um, you know, you know, okay, let's say now you're requesting or you're, you're asking for a subpoena for someone's cell phone, laptop, and iPad, okay, but you still have to know what to ask for. You have to know what, you know, ask that person certain questions. Uh, you know, when did they text this person or are they on Instagram? So it's just, I guess, uh, in my opinion, an awareness of that cyber world uh, and, and kind of an, an embracement of that. But in our field, absolutely, we're, we're never going to be totally detached from that. Uh, we, we still need to align ourselves with those human components because they, um, they definitely won't go away. That's for sure. That's great. That's, I think, a great time to leave it for today. Speaking of that, we built a nice little community here. So thank you all for your questions. And we're able to do this from all over the world. So I appreciate your time, Dr. Skiba, and everyone's time for listening. 
Um, if you do have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out through an advisor or a faculty member or an admissions counselor. As you see, there's information for contacting us. If you do have follow-up questions related to this or about our programs here at CSU Local, we encourage you to reach out to us at any time.